and still. That's all right. Right. Fine. So God's doing something in your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we start, I know there's some people outside, but we're going to start inside. I want you to take off your Anglican caps or your Methodist caps or your Pentecostal cap, whatever it is that you wear, I want you to take that off. Right? Can you do that? By faith, let's take it off. Yes. Go for the history. Let's take it off. Yes. Right. And uh, let's just pretend we might be a couple of thousand years earlier and we are gathering. Possibly it could be the upper room or somewhere like that. But we're just a bunch of Christians together who have just met with Jesus. In fact, Jesus has just been crucified, raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and we are left behind. So we have encountered the living Christ, the risen Christ. And um, He has sent us to go and wait, as we have heard so beautifully this morning, to wait. To wait not for something that we know about. To go and wait not for something, but someone. To go and wait for someone. And that someone was the promise of the Father. The precious Holy Spirit. And if, you, if I can just make something clear this morning. The Holy Spirit is not a wind. He is not oil and he's not fire and he's not whatever. Those are the symbols. He's not a dove. He is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We are talking about gifts of Almighty God. We talk about the person of Almighty God. Do you believe that? Yes. 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 You know, we were saying something about becoming less so that He can become more, but unless we know how great the God is that we are serving and not just serving by doing, because we can do that well. I'm a doer, I can do things. But living in Him. I don't know, I've got some notes, I don't know where I'm going, but here we go. Uh, <laughs> I want you to stand and I want us to sing a song. Do you know that song? It goes like this. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Yes. I want you to focus on mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. I've forgotten the words now. Okay, maybe if I sing another one. Awesome in this place, mighty
Sitten. I've got a couple of scriptures. I'm just going to read one so at least you can say I've read from the Bible. Because <laughs> I will quote some. But uh, I feel like I was just saying this week as I was just trying to gather my thoughts. Where am I going? <coughs> um, I just couldn't gather my thoughts. You know? I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you just cannot Never. gather your thoughts. That is not a nice place to be in. Especially if you like to be in control of your thoughts. Let's go to Acts 3. And I'm saying, Lord, you know, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about revival, refreshing revival. Refreshing revival is like mist, you know, that just gently fall on us. It's refreshing revival. That's what we want. A revival, refreshing revival. And the other word that goes with that, revival, refreshing revival, restoration, cannot go without relationship, intimacy with God. That's really where I wanted to go this morning, is intimacy with God. But I think we're going to be hopping, you know, when you go across a river from stone to stone. I think that's what we're going to do here. Uh, but let's just go to Acts 3 so I can try and gather my thoughts. So what I was going to say is that I said, Holy Spirit, you are messing with me. You are messing <laughs> with me. Because I need to know where I'm going and what I'm doing. And you say, just go with me. Okay, so here we go. Um, Acts 3, chapter 3, verse 19. This is a word we don't like to hear. Peter is saying, after they've healed the crippled man and they before the, 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 the leaders, you know, they are, are accused and, and persecuted here for, um, they questioning them for healing the lame man. Um, Peter says in verse 17, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance to talk about how they killed Jesus, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying, His Christ would suffer. Then he says to them these words, Repent. Repent then. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Repent. Repent so that your sins might be wiped out and times of refreshing may come. And then chapter 2, this question asked to Peter 2. After they were filled with the Holy Spirit and all this commotion and they were preaching the gospel and telling them, the people cried out and they said, what did they say? What must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent. I didn't say repent. What? He didn't just say repent. Three words he said. Repent. Talk to me. Remember, you've taken your Anglican caps off so you can talk to me now. Repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, three things here. We heard about already. God is, I believe what God is saying to the church in this time that the, the God has got a package. His salvation is not just one thing. Yes, Jesus come into my heart, forgive me, and I'm going to heaven. No, that's just the beginning. There's far more to it. So I believe God is reviving. God is reviving the gospel. What is the gospel all about? Repent. That's our response to the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus that he was buried and that he rose again. And the gospel is the mystery of God, that God's intent through the gospel, that the gospel will be preached, and that his intent through the preaching of the gospel is that he will make no, he will make no, no to powers and principalities, the manifold wisdom of God, that when they look at sinful mankind and they see in us sons and daughters of God, that is a miracle, that is a mystery, transformed lives by the power of God. That's what it's all about. There's a far bigger picture. It's not just us, me, making a decision, but it's about me making a decision, about me being filled by the power of God, and about me being transformed by the power of God. So that when people look at me, they see the gospel. I am the message. I am, I am the message. You are the message. How is the world going to know what Jesus is like if they say, show us Jesus? What are you going to say? What did Jesus say when Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father? What did he say? 
Hello. I've been so long with you. And you say, show us the Father. You're out, Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And my question to you is, oh God, where am I going? <laughs> if we, you and I, have Almighty God, we need to get this. We have, you know, kids, shake yourself a little bit, say, just listen to this. You have Almighty God indwelling you. That is mind boggling. We have God dwelling in us. A while back, uh, God gave me, uh, I preached a sermon, and the title was Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap. You've been to London before. You got underground. Oh, yeah. Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap. And the Spirit is whispering to the church Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap. We know it here. We say it here, but it's not here, and it doesn't show in our lives. If I say that I have the Spirit of God living in me, I'm talking about um, in Luke. We just go to Luke with you, the beginning of Luke. Oh, I can say, in the beginning of Luke, the angel comes to Mary and he says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And he tells her how it's going to happen. This is impossible because we know that you're going to have a baby. Unless you do certain things, that's not going to happen. There's going to be no conception. But he says, Mary, this is how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit of God will come upon you. And the power of God will do something inside of you. He will conceive the baby inside of your womb. And that baby that will be conceived will be called the Son of Almighty God. How was it going to happen? Was she secretly going to sleep with Joseph so she could have a baby? And what the angel said would come true? No. God had a plan. An impossible plan. He said the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the power of God. The, 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 when it speaks about the power, it speaks about the dunamis, the power of God. A power that can only come from God. Can it come from man? It's not about ability or something we can go and push weights and get strong enough to do it or get our minds disciplined enough to, to work it out. It's a power, divine power of God will come upon you. And in Acts, it speaks about the same power. When you, are, when you receive the Holy Spirit, He says you will receive power. Dunamis. That power that is from God above. God's power. We've read Ephesians this morning. And you know what's so wonderful about verse 19? He Paul prays that prayer for the Ephesians. And he says that they may know the greatness of the power of God for who? You can talk to me after someone. Those that believe. Go and read it. So I want you to tell me. I'm not telling you something. I want you to tell me what the word says. I want you to listen to yourself so that what you are saying can drop in your heart. The power, I want you to know, Paul says, the greatness, the greatness of the power of God that is at work in you. It's for you. And at the end of chapter 3, it says there, the power of God that is at work in us. We are His workmanship. It's His power at work within us. His Dunamis, the same word, dunamis, the divine power of God that is at work in me. And then he carries on to say that it's the same power that did what? Raised Jesus. Raised Jesus from the dead. Now that is awesome. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that is at work in you. And it's a power that's at work in me.
what we need to realize is let's go to the word and with all respect. Not what Sally Jones or anyone else says, or Ed Hurt or me or whatever. What does the word say to you? What does the word say to you? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Let what is here drop over here. He's saying to us, do you know the biggest heartache that we've got hundreds of thousands of Christians that do not know Jesus. We do not know the Holy Spirit. We do not know the life that God has for us. We don't have intimacy with Him. We have a grand pup. And his name is Tyson. He's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Those are the best dogs. If you can have one, that's the one you want to have. And he can beg for food. <laughs> but he doesn't only beg for food. He is like every other Chadwick man in our family. <laughs> they constantly want attention. <laughs> and so Tyson, if we sit and visit, will come. We were just sitting around the table chatting the other night. And I looked at him and there he was. Sitting by Russell with his head on his on his leg, and he was just like looking at him. Will you just notice me? Will you just touch me? Will you just stroke me? I'm here, please just see me. Just begging for attention. <laughs> and you know your crime this weekend is Lord. I want more. I want more of you. And He is saying to us. I've given you all. I want more of you. I want more of you. I've given you all that I have. I've given you my spirit. Not only is he in you, but you said he is with us. Isn't that powerful? And he says, I, I am longing. And I can just see Tyson's big eyes. I'm waiting for you. Not to come and do the things. But to come and be with me. Come and hear me. What am I saying to you? And what I'm saying, how is that affecting your life? And for me, that takes us to... Uh, when do we finish? Um, Five minutes. Let's go to John 15. John 15, John 14. The disciples asked Jesus... It was Philip that said, Jesus, show us the Father. And then he says to him, Philip, have you not seen me? The Father and I, we are one. And then he carries on and he goes to verse 15. And I thought, chapter 15, that is such a beautiful picture of understanding what God is saying to us when he says, I want to be intimate with you. You know, some of us, we, not, we don't do too well with the intimate thing. Hey, some of us, we do, and others, we don't. Uh, you know, we can sing to God, but we, we, we struggle to be intimate with Him. We struggle to say, you know, I can say, we love you, Lord, but to say, Lord, I love you. I love you, and I receive your love. And just to sit there and let Him talk to you, and you talk to Him. And even if you fall asleep, He doesn't mind. Sometimes He falls asleep in His presence. And you know, Tyson, He doesn't mind. If He can just come and lay with you, you can sleep, it's okay. He can just cuddle up and sit next to you on the couch. He's a very happy dog. Not that I'm not saying Holy Spirit's dog. What I'm saying is it's the presence. It's the presence. Spending time with Him. Being one with Him. Our life is intrinsically one with God. And that's what we need to see. Because if we see that, it changes everything. Our whole perspective of serving Him changes. Because it's not about doing. It's about being. It's about being. And so He says in John 15, I am the true vine. So he tells the disciples, they say, show us the Father. So he says, okay, come, come listen nicely. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he trims clean, so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, I've never really liked that bit of scripture there. I like the true vine. But when it says the Father cuts off the bride, I don't like that. Because I didn't understand it. And then, not so long ago, 
It's like a couple of months ago, the penny dropped and the revelation came. The Father, who is the Father? He is the gardener. He may cut off the dead branches, but that's for good. So if we think about this illustration Jesus is using, he's saying, come, I want to be intimate with you. Father and I, we are one, you know. We and him and he and us. And, you know, and it gets like, quite confusing with like, this whole thing. But he says, I want to show you what it is like. And he uses this illustration of a vine, a gardener. So if a gardener is going to plant a vine, what is he first of all going to do? Come talk to me. What do you think he's going to do? Put his hand in his pocket, go to the nursery, go look for a vine. And he's going to choose one, the one that he wants. And he's going to choose his vine, and then he's going to take it home. And what is he going to do then? Going to find the right place to plant his little vine, because he knows which will be the best place for that vine. And then he plants his little vine. And what does he do then? He waters it. He takes it up. He cares for it. And then he begins to prune it where it needs to be pruned. Why does he prune it? Because he doesn't like this little vine? No, because he wants it to be fruitful. This vine. Why do you think the gardener bought the vine? To bear fruit. That's the only reason. I'm going to go buy a grapevine because I want grapes. Yeah, I want grapes. So I'm going to buy this vine. I just to stand there and appreciate all the green leaves on my vine. But I want to see fruit from this vine. That's what I want. So he says, the, what I want you to see is that the gardener, the father, is the one that cares for us. He has chosen us in him, hasn't he? He is the one that has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. He is the one that is at work within us. We are his workmanship. He is the one that comes and says, Oh, a little dirt on the face here. Let's just take it off, you know. Um, he's the one that says, Oh, you bumped your toe. Let's just see to that. He's the one that comes. And if there's something that is not right, he will cut that dead branch off so that the vine can be more fruitful. So his hand is not to come and chop and judge, because that was my impression initially. No, it's to come and care and to encourage growth, facilitate growth, to look after this vine. So the vine, take note, is totally dependent on the gardener. And then Jesus comes and he says, I'm the true vine. And what he wants to tell us today, he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Mm, you're not the vine, and you're not the fruit. You are the branches. A very interesting fact about a branch. What is a branch? It's an extension of the vine. The branch without the vine is nothing. The branch without the vine cannot do anything. The branch without the vine is just a dead piece of wood. No good for anything but to be burned in the fire. So the branch is totally dependent upon the vine. Totally dependent in Christ. It's such a lovely illustration. Well, this is apparently what happens. If you graft a, a vine, if you, uh, you graft the, put the graft into the, the vine, then what happens is the graft shoots out little roots into the vine. And then the vine sap comes up into the graft and it begins to flow through the branch. The branch is totally dependent upon the vine. And what, what Jesus then says to them, he says two words, abide in me. In other word, remain in me. Because without me, you cannot be fruit. So you can be a little branch and you can say, come on little branch, try it harder. Try it harder, a little great, try it harder. Let's see what happens. Without the vine, the branch cannot do anything. It's the life of God in us. The life of God in us. So we need to have total trust, total dependence and confidence in the vine. He knows what he's doing. It's his life that, that flows through us. And you know, the amazing thing is that it's the life of the vine that bears the fruit. It's not the branch. He's just there to bear the fruit that the vine's going to bear. It's not amazing. I mean, the wonderful thing is the fruit is for the enjoyment of 
or someone else, not the branch or the vine. The God has got a far greater plan than just your happiness and my happiness. He comes and He chooses us. He fills us. First of all, we're born again. You know what happens when you're born again? Do you ever think about that? What happens when you're born again? When you invite Jesus into your life, what happens? Oh, the power of the Holy Spirit overshadows you and something gets born again, quickened inside of you. There's a conception of the Spirit in your spirit and the life of God is ignited inside of us. I am born of God. I am born of the Spirit. That's been born again. I now am a child of God. And then he says, that's cool, that's great, but there's something more. And we see what happens in Acts. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they are filled with power again. And they are given boldness to be witnesses for him. And so in my experience, I gave my life to Jesus. Something happened. The Holy Spirit started to work in my life, but there was something missing. And I didn't know what it was. And then uh, uh, I heard about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when I heard about it, I thought, yes, that's what it is. This is it. I need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was prayed for. I was at school. I shared this uh, last year. Um, went to the teacher and shared with us. She prayed with me. God filled me with the Holy Spirit. I just had like three sounds. I spoke those sounds out. And my life was changed. I had an encounter with God. By faith, I received something happened. What was it? I don't know, but he did something inside of me that changed my life. And so I started a journey of being bold and declaring the gospel, the, the, the gospel of, of Jesus. I was preaching to everyone. In fact, this was in the 70s when we had revival in the 70s. What was revival for me it was? When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, my life changed. And so did those around me because they could not be untouched by what God had done in my life. And we had revival in our school and in the boarding school that I was in because God touched one life. One life. And there was revival. But that wasn't, that wasn't all. There was far more. We tried to touch a bit on that. Then there is the continual staying full of the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? By the little branch abiding in the vine, remaining in the vine. And if you abide in the vine or remain in the vine, remember what the first verse was that I read? Repent. Repent. You know, when God works in our lives, when the power of Almighty God works in us, He brings conviction. Second revival I went to was in Pensacola. Did anybody go to Pensacola when they had the revival in the late 90s? Amazing revival. We went from South Africa. And when I walked into that auditorium, I was absolutely, I actually went up. My expectation was to go. And I wanted God like to throw me on the floor and let me roll around and be crazy so that if I, I, I must be so stupid that I will never be in a, uh, what is the word I want? Uh, uh, Inhibited or self-conscious. I would disobey God when he speaks to me. But God, he didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> he did it for Russell. He was like drunk in the spirit and he was like all over the place. And I just stood there and watched. I thought, okay, God, what about me? But this is what God did for me. When I walked into that place, I was absolutely struck by the holiness of God. It was like for a moment I wasn't there. It was like, it was like I was just in the glory of God in heaven. And all I felt was my sinfulness and my wickedness. I just felt so unclean. And God was just so holy and so great. But there was just this amazing love beckoning. He said, come. Come. He didn't say, oh, look at you. He said, come. In his holiness, he drew me. He said, come. So whatever there is in my life that needs to be worked on, come. And that's what he does to us when we abide in him. When the things come that is not from him. It's unrighteous. And you may think, I'm looking at Christians here, well, I don't steal and I don't uh, 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 cook the tax man. I don't do this and I don't do that. But you know what? I can look at this room and I look at myself, I speak to myself. There are loads of attitudes here that is not from God. There are loads of resentments and feelings and animosity and stuff 
and hearts here that is not from God, that doesn't show Jesus. And I believe God is saying to us, wake up. We've read that scripture again and again. Wake up, those that are asleep. Wake up, church. And we need to know it is not okay. It's not okay to have the power of God. Not just the power of God, we have God. We are God carriers, you know that. Oh my word, I don't think we can, I don't think we can comprehend that. I am a God carrier. I am carrying Almighty God, the presence of God and the Spirit of God in me. So wherever I go, whatever I say, whatever I do, He is there, He is part of it. So when, I, when I'm awful to my husband, where is the Holy Spirit? we so got used to the ways that we behave and the ways that we do things in that we don't even hear him say, oh, that wasn't a good one, was it? Hmm. Is that what Jesus would have done? We don't even hear it. Because we're not bad, are we? We're not sinners, are we? But he's saying to us, I want to be seen in you. It begins in our homes, isn't it? That's always the hardest place. Because we can be nice to everyone else until we come home. And God is saying, if we abide in Him, we have a gardener. And He's there to prune us. Let's begin to yield to Him. Abide is about yielding, about surrendering, about repenting when we do wrong. Because we do wrong. And it will happen. We don't leave it. We don't cover it up. We don't say it's okay because it is not okay. It is not okay. When people look at us, they need to see Jesus because we have him in us. So God longs, the Holy Spirit longs to have intimacy. You know, we can have revival. There's two pillars of revival. I'm going to say three. One is a hunger in our hearts because God says he will fill the hungry, doesn't he? So before revival, often people have been praying. And then this revival that is absolutely a sovereign move of God. Nothing to do with man. God moves. He pours out His Spirit. And I'm sure that somewhere, somehow, people have been praying. But it's something God does. You know, when we were filled with the Holy Spirit, there was no church involved. There was no minister involved. It was just a bunch, bunch of kids at school. And uh, God knew the hunger in my heart. And so He met me. And then my friends got touched. God did it. It was sovereign. And then, like I said, there's a hunger in our hearts. And I would say the third one is, which is a bit of what Shannon said too, it's how, how fully we abide in the vine. That branch needs to be totally connected to the vine, totally trust the vine. And it, when there's blockages, get rid of it. When God speaks to us, allow the Father to lovingly prune. And you know what's so wonderful when He comes to prune? Like I said last night, He always exchanges. So if He takes away your unforgiveness, He brings peace and forgiveness. If He takes away your hatred, He brings His love. Whatever He ta takes away your shame, He brings his, his forgiveness and His acceptance. Whatever we give to Him, we allow Him to prune us from. He brings in the missing bit. He take what takes what doesn't belong to him and he brings the missing bird. And for me, that is the revival that we need. We say, God, revive us. What do we need revival from? We need to be refreshed and revived by our knowledge of him. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better, God. That we may have the bigger picture of why we have been placed on this earth. That we may know the hope to which you called us. What is our hope? Yeah, eternal life of Him. But also that we may know the power, the riches of His inheritance in the saints first. That He has got an inheritance in the saints. We are His body. He is the head. That when the world look at the church, not the denomination, us, the church, that they will see the body of Christ. That we will know the greatness of His power that is at work within us. There's nothing in us that cannot be achieved or happen because of the greatness of God's power that's at work within us. We, our part is just to learn, to repent, to yield, to abide. And it's not about my striving, trying a bit harder. It's about 
drawing from the life that we receive from the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit. It's about the His life in us that we will draw from that life. And we say, God, revive within me. Revive within me. Help me to be, oh, this is another big word that we don't like, obedient to your voice. So that when you speak, I listen. When you speak, I obey. When we obey, God comes and does amazing things. You want God to do amazing things in your life? Amen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we can go like the Israelites. I've done that. I've gone around the mountain like 40 something years. Probably our biggest challenge that we've had is not, I won't say with people, it's a my marriage relationship. Is that the devil knows, you know? And you think 20 years before going down the same mountain. Uh-huh. What is it? Stubbornness of heart. Hardness of heart. And we think it's okay. So, church, I want to say to you today, it's not okay. <clears throat> What is not from God, let it go. Allow the gardener to come and prune. Let it be his loving fingertips that come and prune away and cut away the things that is not from him so that his life can be revived in us, that us as little branches will abide in him and stop striving and doing and whatever else, but draw life from the vine that is our everything. Yes, everything that we need. And that we will bear fruit that will be for the Father's glory. Because that's what it's about. It's not about our comfort. It's about the Father's glory. Let's pray. Father God, you are so amazing. You are so awesome. Lord, I pray that you will take the word that you have for each one of us. And that you will plant it in our hearts that it will take root and then it will grow. It will become flesh in our hearts. Lord, that we will mind the gap, that we will repent of believing things in our heads, even saying it with our mouths, but not living it in our lives, not carrying it in our hearts. But oh God, will you come? Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know you better. Come and teach us, Holy Spirit, how to abide in the vine, that we may be intimate with you, that we may know your voice, that we may obey your voice, that we may yield to you, surrender to you, Lord. And in our weakness, allow you to make us strong and to bear fruit for the glory of the Father, because that is what it is all about. Holy Spirit, come have your amazing way in us. Come and break our hearts with the greatness of our God, the love of our God, the tenderness of the Father, the all-sufficiency of the Son. Oh Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.